Uh, we are on air. Ladies and gentlemen, I would just like you to know that for the past half an hour we've been chatting and I didn't realise that you had to press the big green button that said start broadcast, so none of it is uh, recorded. But This has been the biggest fiasco I've ever taken part in so far in my it's, life. It's actually taken us an hour and eight minutes to get live on air. And that's got to be some kind of record. I mean, I hear people complain about uh, Google Hangouts all the time, but that's got to be something, something else. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's not, like I said, it's 97% my fault because I do not know computers, but we've got there in the end. Um, here we are. Here we are. Right. I wanted we have to. A couple start... of precursors. <laughs> yes. I've already, see, I've, I've already said this, but I have to say it again. I wanted to start with uh, two precursors. The first one is I've very recently come back from a work do and I'm slightly on the tipsy side. So um, you might notice that. I think Chris has recently while we've been trying to sort this out. Um, it's made his technological expertise even greater. Yeah, I mean, I could build a computer. Right now. If someone just said build a computer, I could do it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, my second precursor is that um, I do not, study this period i study period a period millions of years later i study ancient greece and rome um, and all that that entails so i am no expert on what we're going to be talking about which is extremely early prehistory um seven million years ago i'm actually for a bit going to go back 18 million years ago but i am no expert on this and may well get things very wrong well, if you recall, I only got one date right in our last talk, so uh, you don't need to worry too much about that. It's weird, though, because I've spoken to people who've watched the video and they all say he was awesome, he knew everything, and because they, they don't check it, they just presume because you sounded confident... Oh, don't say that. ...that, that you got it right. Broad. <laughs> Someone else has just joined our You're conversation. You're me historically. Hello? Oh, yes, he has. Is anyone He's... else... There? Oh, because there he is. There, Robert Parker. Nice to, meet, nice to meet you, Robert Parker. The only one who's actually got the webcam going. So, well done, sir. Um, right, so, we, what, 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 how do you want to do this? Do you want me to just tell the narrative and you jump in with questions as you like? That works for me, yeah, that would be perfect. Okay, cool. So, I, I want to start off with some stuff that you'll be pretty interested in, being a modern historian. And it's basically um, two, two um, Victorian gentlemen, one of them you I might like well have already. heard of, and a few quotes that they said about our earliest prehistory. The first dude was this biologist called Thomas Huxley, and he was around 1863. And he was the, sort of the first person that noticed the anatomical relationships between the apes and mankind. And this was really, really controversial at the time. I mean, the Christians went mad over it. Um, I but believe he was. Pre this was pre-Charles Darwin, obviously. It, it was pre... They were working at the same time, but it was pre-origin of species, and you've guessed the next person I was going to talk about. So, well done for that. Um, basically, he, he's got this great quote, and he talks about the search for our earliest ancestors as the question of questions for humankind. Oh, fantastic. Um, thought that was a nice one. And the second dude is Charles Darwin, and this is slightly later in 1871, and it was at that point that he predicted that the origins of humanity would be found in Africa. And these two, both guys, um, Darwin was at, at very first... It, it was sort of um, laughed at, but he was considered a genius in his own time. Thomas Huxley wasn't at the time. He wasn't believed, but they were both to be proved right. So uh, that's why uh, we don't know so much about Huxley, why he's not so much a household name as Darwin. No, I mean, um, Aldous Huxley would be, but Thomas Huxley sort of has gone by the wayside. Um, but yeah, basically... For such a visionary gentleman. Well, he was, yeah, he was the first person to notice it. I mean, it seems so obvious to us now, but back then, I suppose they wouldn't have given it a second glance. No one would have Well, thought. they already knew where we came from back then, didn't they? Oh, we came from the ribs of, well, Ad, Adam was we made, made from dust, and Eve was made from his ribs, eh? Yeah. Nice story. Um, but if you've got such a generally accepted explanation, why would you bother looking for a different one? 
True, true. I mean, that had been going for so long. But I think, I think by the Victorian period, it was considered that, that, that most people took the Bible figuratively. Um, yeah. It was thought of as um, as parables and that kind of thing. So it did sort of improve as time went on. Um, it wasn't considered literal until, you know, like na- the 1950s. It, it was a slow progression. But um, anyway, let's get back to the topic. I wanted to start seven million years ago, but then I was researching this and I found something about um, human prehistory 18 to 12 million years ago. And one thing you're going to notice, oh, being, yeah, being a modern historian, the first thing that I must explain when we're talking about such distant past is that there is so little evidence and there is so um, the dates are so huge that it, it's going to sound very, very imprecise. I don't want to use the word guesswork, but there's an awful lot that we just can't know, isn't there? There's a lot we don't know. There's a lot that's... I've sort of split this into theory and fossil evidence. And oh. um, there's a little bit of molecular biology, which I don't understand in the slightest, but Give I will explain shot. anyway. Basically... Apparently, if you just sound knowledgeable, people will believe you, right? Yes, true. So, um, you've got three groups of um, primates... Back, uh, say, let's go right to the beginning, um, say, eight to ten million years ago. Let's talk in that period. Hmm. Um, and um, they are monkeys, um, apes, and hu- the, the precursor to humans, which are called hominidae. Right? Hominidae. hominidae. And they can be traced to a common ancestor that was the uh, spawning of these three groups. So this isn't when man developed from eight. This was when some really far back in the past uh, creature evolved into the three separate groups, one of which would become humans eventually. So we have one universal ancestor that stems off various trees of uh, species development. And I'm really glad you used the word trees because I use the word trees all the time. A lot of people think of evolution as a very linear event. And the, there was, you know, you've got the ascent of man where, you know, sort of hunched over and then a little bit more upright and a little bit more upright. And while there is some truth in that, it wasn't that simple. There was, you've got to imagine it as a tree. There were, say, four million years ago, I'll go back to the 80 million years in a bit, but say four million years ago, there were possibly dozens, hundreds of different hominidae roaming the plains of Africa only one of it which would eventually evolve into humans. So I have the theory that uh, the group that would evolve into humans actually just went and wiped out all the other ones. That's, I that's assume pretty, we'll get into that. We'll get that sort of that's at the very end of what I was going to talk about because we do get to the point where we get the tool makers, but that is that is far. I mean, that's only like two. That's two million years ago. It's nothing. The beginning um, of a proud human tradition. Exactly, yes, the first of many genocides. Hurrah. Huzzah. Um, but, um, oh, not my microphone then. Basically, this, right, going back to this molecular biology thing, because I might as well, I don't understand it, but you I'll give it my best shot. Basically, the way they can sort of trace it, we don't know anything about this common ancestor, but we can trace the date to around 18 to 12 million years ago, because... There's proteins in the blood of all three of the branches that evolved, the humans, the apes, and the monkeys. And they sort of, um, it, the, the proteins evolve at a constant rate. I, this means nothing to me. This is just what I've read. They, they evolve at a constant rate. So mm. you can actually backdate it, a bit like carbon dating in archaeology, I suppose, with oh, the right. carbon couch dropping. And... Um, you, so you can backdate it to the point where it's split, and you can, yeah, and you can also backdate it to the point where we split from the um, sort of chimpanzees and became a full hominidae, and that was about five to six million years ago. So you've got the split. You've got the one common ancestor, mm. eighteen to twelve million years ago, that splits into the three groups of primates, one of which is hominidae. Um, and um, we've got the hominidae split into what they call Australopithecines, which I'll get onto in a minute, five to six million years ago. 
And Australopithecines basically just take it to mean um, sort of proto-humans, a, a mix between apes and humans, with most of them being very ape-like, but with slight human characteristics that slowly evolve. Is this the so-called infamous missing link? Well, I'll get on to the missing link in a bit. Um, it's th There are a few different missing links, and a lot of missing links have been found. But there is... Um, there is oh, what was it called? Hang on, let me just check my research. There was... There was yes, it's called Austra This is this is going way ahead. But there was a fossil found that was called Australopithecus africanus, mm. and at the moment it's very heavily debated. Some people say it's on the side of ape. Some people say it's on the side of man. And that to me sounds like it could be the missing link. We're talking six to seven million years ago when the split occurred. Um, and if you've got people, so we get a point where they're so close that people can't actually tell. Exactly. But no matter how close they get people will always want a missing link from further in the past. Do you know what mm. I mean? So as more missing links are found, the, the, the term missing link will never go away because in let, until we find, you know, all the fossils in the world, it's um, there's so few fossils as it is, but we do know a fair bit about life then through them that mm. whenever we find one that's a bit earlier, that's a bit more sort of ape or, um, you know, very, very in between like we have found now, people always want to say, oh, well, what's the missing link that turned it into that? So, yeah. so you're never... And just never satisfied. As soon exactly. as you find out one stage, you need to know the, the previous one. Exactly, yeah, the precursor. So, um, right, so basically you get the, about the proteins and the blood, because I sure don't, but do you understand I, that? I grasp the, uh, the concept. Yeah, yeah, I just think of it as sort of like carbon dating, which it probably isn't, but it's go, it's tracing it, because uh, yeah. it's something that moves, that goes at a constant rate, so you can trace it back. So, big, right, so that's, um, that's sort of the, the common ancestor, but if we start the chunk of this uh, video, it's going to start seven million years ago. And basically, okay. you've got all these group, these three groups of primates roaming around in the trees before seven million years ago. It's a, Africa was very um, wooded, forested. Yeah. And um, you would not really be able to tell any difference between the hominidae and the chimpanzees, for example. They're pretty much the same tree-dwelling animals, you know, on all fours. Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. And then about 7 million years ago, there was a big environmental change. Um, the trees began to recede and grassy plain, like savannah-like um, environments began to appear. A bit like what we've got in Africa now when you've got the big open savannas. That was became... the result of some nat natural disaster or just a natural evolution of the world's? I believe it was from a mini ice age. But you've got to remember, we're in Africa, so whereas Ice Age, you think, oh, the world's covered in ice. It wasn't, but it was a colder but environment. Such, for such a cold snap has further reaching effects than just cooling things down in certain areas. Exactly, yeah. I'm sure, you know, up in Britain, we were probably covered in ice. But um, in Africa, it just sort of, it was still still nice weather, still lovely weather. You could have a picnic, but hmm. um, the trees died off, and um, savannas became more prevalent. And... Um, what you've got to imagine is that surviving, surviving on a savanna, surviving on a grassy plain, you, you need very, very different skills from when we were living in the trees. So you, oh, first of all, the main thing is you need to be able to stand upright because if you're on all fours, you can't see any predators coming. Um, there were lions and hyenas at the time, and you oh, need to be able... Right. Sorry? Oh, there were uh, rec predators that we'd recognise nowadays back then. Oh, yeah. I mean, going back seven million years, most of the creatures we would know. I think there were there were megafauna, because I don't think some of them had died off yet. Like, I'm sure I'm the... seeing some kind of giant bird thing on a BBC dramatisation of... Yes, exactly. There was there was a documentary, and there was like a giant bird and a giant bear and a giant sloth, and I think there were the megafauna hadn't completely died out. But Get so most... by a giant sloth, that would be so embarrassing. Oh God, imagine you killed by a sloth. 
<laughs> Put that on the tombstone. <laughs> His life ended in sloth mollation. I don't even oh. think that's proper English. Um, anyway, Blame so... Yeah, yeah, I'm blaming the booze on a lot of things. But um, you can spot predators, so you need to be upright. But as a result of the necessity to be upright, all of a sudden you've got this creature that isn't on all fours anymore, that has its hands exposed, that can do things with its hands. Mm. So they're able to use, not necessarily make tools, but pick up a rock. Mm. Do you know what I mean? They could, they could, they've got mobility. Like they've... you see some primates doing nowadays. Exactly. Think of when you see, um, oh, you see chimps with twigs wheedling out grubs, and you see them with rocks trying to crack open nuts. It's mm. still around today. Um, and it frees, it, your hands become free, but they still do reside on all fours. Whereas hominidae, it was slightly different. They began to walk upright as well. So they were walking on their two legs and their hands were constantly free. So how rapidly were these changes taking place for the species? Because I assume that adapting to walk upright takes quite a considerable, uh, makes quite a considerable change to your anatomy as a whole. We're talking millions of years. I mean, um, there's there's so few fossils, but they they do paint a picture of um, us becoming sort of um, having more experience with um, tools. And um, this, I mean, this is it's very difficult to say because we just we don't know really i'm not asking for an exact date it's, but no i know it's 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 difficult because this like i said there's so few fossils and they skip so many millions of years yeah. that for all we know we don't have any fossils of when that process started do you know what i mean like um, so the so the fossil record there's just been a lot of filling in the gaps for for this kind of information this is the theory. I mean, every I should have stated before this, everything that I'm talking about now is theory. Um, I'll get onto the fossil evidence later, but this is all just theory and um, not speculation, but, you know, there's, there's, there's evidence behind it. Sorry, that's my blooming virus software going mad again. Um, but um, it's, there's, there's, there's no tangible evidence. Okay. Okay. So... You now, oh. yes. Well, whilst I've paused you for a second, I know I mentioned it before, but I probably should say it again. Um, I hope you don't mind if I don't carry on calling you shades. <laughs> the oh God, yeah. Um, having well, yeah, having got to know you in person first, I think suddenly switching to use your internet moniker, it felt rather strange in our last I can, talk. <laughs> I can imagine. Um, I have never mentioned my actual name on a video. I'm not bothered in the slightest. My Facebook account has Shades and Acronisto, Alex Gore next to it. It doesn't bother me in the slightest. But um, well, I haven't mentioned done it. Now. I've done it now. That's the first mention of my name, Alex. Um, how are you? Thank you very much. How are you, um, Quentin Forrester? <laughs> QF? Uh, no. I should actually say the origins of the QF, which is in all of my screen names on things, is actually a result of my Xbox Live gamer tag. It's not my actual name. Ah, right. But Chris okay. is. So yeah. There we go. <laughs> cool. Internet. So our thousands of viewers now you know who we are. <laughs> the world knows. It'll be on the news tomorrow. Um, right. Where were we? I've, I've, I've got lost. Um, yeah. Oh, so we're talking about teeth. yeah spotting predators, freeing up the hands, but. Also, when you, imagine when you're in massive open spaces with not much cover, you also need to be able to outrun predators. So yeah. we started being able to move faster and faster, became very mobile creatures. So and simultaneously, as the hands became more dexterous and useful, the legs must have had to adapt to become stronger to account for the extra it. work that they were having to do to move the body. Yes, exactly. That's a really good way of putting it. And uh, that's how these theories develop. Do you know what I mean? It's it's um, it's common it's a lot of logical sense steps. With, yeah, it's common sense of a few sort of broken bits of the puzzle, and then using common sense to fill in the gaps. And if it mm. makes sense, you know, that's a theory. But of so, course, evolution doesn't always follow uh, common sense approaches. No, I mean evolution itself as is completely um, random. It's you get. Um, 
I think it moves in a slow trail and then you get mutations and there's a lot of dead ends. I mean, I'll talk about that later. A few, there's um, a few different australopithecines that were just evolutionary dead ends. I'm told that I don't know how much truth there is in this. It's about the way that the human nervous system works for controlling the fingers. Mm -hmm. I'm told that the way it works, the way that a, a signal is sent from the brain to close, to move one finger, the right. signal that's first sent is a signal to close all of the fingers, and then a second signal is sent from the brain to not to counteract the order to the other fingers that aren't intended oh, yeah. to be used. So the the way it works, it's the whole like nervous system and everything has evolved through just this sort of mishmash of finding what works and what doesn't, and it's actually not a particularly efficient system. What we've got is one that works, not one that works really, really well. Perfectly, yeah. Well, I mean, I remember Richard Dawkins talking about the human eye and how it is not a perfect structure and how, you know, it has to turn the image around and then project it back. Oh, yeah, it's totally inefficient. Yeah. And another good one is, if we were perfect... Why are our reproductive organs next to the waste disposal system? <laughs> <laughs> Always like that one. Oh. But, um, <laughs> yes, anyway, um, so you, we're moving quickly. And another thing is that there's a big change in diet because mm. we're not, fr we, we still ate plants and fruits, but they were less abundant and we started scavenging for meat. Mm. And some people actually think that eating, one of the theories is that eating meat, I'm talking about over millions of years now through the different australopithecines and homos that I'll do in another video. Sounds funny, homos. Homos basically just means australopithecine, mix of ape and human. Homos considered fully human. Okay. Basically, that's how you just take those two categories. But they believe that the greater consumption in meat led to greater brain size. Oh, the pro I assume that a greater intake of protein will also aid in the development of muscles. True, exactly. I'm sure it made us much more robust and stronger. Mm. However, I prefer the theory that it was more our, our wanting to acquire more meat led to, us, to developing more social skills and um, oh, the intelligence came. Group hunting. Exactly, yeah. And I think, I, I don't know why, I just prefer that theory. That it was it wasn't a result of eating meat, it was a result of the necessity to find more meat and I how suppose. Yeah, it just sounds nicer. Yeah. And I suppose I could just jump onto the uh, old historical conclusion that perhaps the reality was somewhere in the middle. Exactly, yeah. I mean, I'm sure both of them contributed, and I'm sure there were other factors that contributed that we don't know about yet. I mean, one thing that I found, like I say, I don't study this, but just learning about it and researching it, is that there is so little that is known, and the, the gaps jump from such huge spaces to so many hominidae we don't know about. Mm. There is, you know, it's we, we have, this is just a random speculation, 5% of the puzzle? 5%. Maybe, yeah. That's... Wow, that, that is a lot of blank space still to be filled. I've just realised, are you answering questions? I've just been reading them. Yeah, we have, I've been using that's this a, part a That's bit. quite funny. <laughs> Where the tits are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish I could find you some, mate. But uh, right. them monkeys, titties, feel free to ask questions if you like. <laughs> That's awesome. You're going to have to keep an eye on that because, like I say, yeah, a little bit tipsy. I can only really focus on one thing at the moment. Yeah. Um, so, basically, at this point, we became omnivorous. We were eating plants. Uh, eating we were also whatever eating we can meat. get our hands on. Um, would, yeah. the, would the change in the uh, planets, the, the um, environment, have affected the sources of food as well? Because I, I always kind of assumed that the step towards becoming omnivorous was in part down to necessity. It's, it's, most of it is down to necessity. It's um, The diet would have completely... You've got, you've, got, you've got tweed tree dwelling creatures that are just running up the trees, grabbing the fruits, um, dealing with predators probably like snakes and yeah. other... I imagine they could just at that point run and hide from all the megafauna just by... Well, Start once they develop the their so speed, and the walking on two legs definitely help with that because it is a more efficient way of moving. Um, Would they still have retained 
some sort of dexterity in climbing trees. I mean, if I'm, I'm imagining things like monkeys fleeing from predators will always just try and run up a tree to get to get out of reach. Would these um, early proto-humans have been able to do that? Definitely. Um, they there's a once we go to about three to four million years ago, there's a very famous Austral Australopithecine called Lucy, and even I, at that, that, point, that name I know. Yeah, it comes up in every documentary about this stuff. It's not even that important. There's more important ones, but it's it's everywhere. But we learn from her that she was very much still um, attached to the trees, and that's four million years ago. We're talking six, seven million years mm. ago. The trees were a huge part of their lives. They would still be very dexterous and be very capable of climbing trees. You've sort of got to imagine little little monkeys running around on the savannas scavenging meat and then a hyena comes and they run away on two legs and jump up a tree and climb it nearly as easily as any monkey would. Now that yeah that's the sort of picture I had I just wanted to be sure that that was accurate. Yeah, yeah that's definitely accurate. Um, it's not till we get to really um, the last part I sort of um, I've got to in this that I'll get to in this video is something called uh, Homo habilis and there's also um, Homo erectus, which comes after that, which is the hilarious name. Um, <laughs> hilarious. It's um, and that's the point when the tree sort of we, we we probably still took shelter in them, but they were not a main main part of human life. Anything mm. before that, they were still very much uh, connected to the trees. So you've got the right picture there, definitely. Well, that's always good to know. Cool. Anyway, let's uh, we'll get off the theory. I'll start chatting about sort of like what we actually know from fossil records. Okay. Um, basically, there was this guy called Raymond Dart in um, 1924, and he was like this anatomist, and um, he was in South Africa, and he found a primate fossil that seemed to have sort of human characteristics. This was the first time. It was uh, very sort of like slightly built, really thin bones, um, very dexterous, um, mm. with a prominent jaw, and he um, but human human sort of like eyes pushed back, more of a rounded head, definitely showing slight human characteristics, and he called that Australopithecus africanus, um, right. and um, that was in 1924. It wasn't actually accepted. Um, his his um, ideas of what the fossil was about until 1959. So it shows wow, you quite the, time. exactly, yeah. So it Very shows you controversial figure there. And it shows how little um, time we've actually had to to study this period without controversy. Because um, mm. for the next fossil, I'm jumping to 2002. That so was that, the, only the second one found. It wasn't the second one found. There were a few in between, but I'm just sort of going over the major ones. I mean, there's lots been discovered in between. There's a place called Olduvai Gorge that a lot of fossils are found that I'll sort of I'll get into later. I can talk about it now if you want. Yeah, just give us a quick overview now. Want if a you quick want overview? Um, oh, right, basically, Olduvai Gorge. I've got like three bullet points. I'm trying to remember what they were about. Screw it. Um, it was basically a lake, and mm. um, it was... Millions of years ago, it was a paradise for all the animals, um, and it was it was it was a sort of lake paradise at the beginning of human history, the period we were just talking about. So you're um, saying basically the Garden of Eden? Yeah, it was the garden. Maybe that is where the Garden of Eden was found. It was basically a waterhole, you know, <laughs> and you see the animals congregate and all that stuff. Um, and it was just fortunately cited to be um, very good at uh, preserving remains. Well, there's a reason for that. Basically, around 100,000 years ago, there was like a massive earthquake, and that's the reason it's called Olduvai Gorge, and it created a massive gorge straight through it. Mm. So you've got to imagine that this was this was a lake, say, seven million years ago, when the very earliest um, sort of hominids are discovered, mm. um, Australopithecines, and then it would be um, it would dry up. And then it would fill again. It would dry up and fill again over millions of years, creating these layers. Oh, um, sedimentary layers. Sedimentary layers. And when this gorge came crashing through, it left a sheer face that uh, revealed all these different layers. Oh, and fantastic. in these different layers, exactly, are um, all the different um, Australopithecines and uh, homos and all that kind of thing. I keep saying homos. It's really funny. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, And uh, so much has been found there. Um, 
it's um, well, I'll get on to what's been found there, but that's that's basically what Old Divide Gorge is. Mm. Uh, there's a, there's a couple uh, called Mary and Louis Leakey who are really you know they they they're experts on these periods and they do a lot of archaeology there and they fa- they found most of the fossils. Yeah, um, that's yeah. their patch. Yes, it's their patch. No one messed with them. I think he died actually, and then Mary Leakey carried oh, that's on. Who, uh... Yeah, yeah, sorry to drop that down, but uh, I think he died and then Mary Leakey carried on for a while and she found quite a lot as well, but they found some really important stuff, which I'll get on to. So, in 2002, um, basically they found the oldest skull, the oldest skull that showed human characteristics, and it was dated to six to seven million years ago. Um it was I'm surprised pre- that, that does actually seem remarkably recent. Yeah, I mean, most of the the discovery is very recent stuff, and it shows where it could be in 20, 40 years, because mm. now there's free reign to study this. Well, well, what, um, what I mean is that if the oldest skull to have human characteristics is only, what, 7 million years old? Yeah, yeah, only that, 7 re- years That old. is amazingly recent, as far as I'm concerned. That's... Well, when you I talk, always expect it, we're talking a much greater time period. No, I mean it depends how you define it. Like I say, 18 million years ago there was a split, and there was there were hom- the classification hominidae, but they were completely ape-like, and mm. they were roaming around for millions of years um, alongside chimpanzees and um, you know all different apes and different monkeys. But you would not be able to tell the the difference between mm. them. Um, and it wasn't until six to seven million years ago when this split happened and um, hominidae showing human characteristics, which we label, and ape characteristics, which we label as Australopithecines, started to emerge. Mm. So this is where we get on to... Did we talk about the missing link? Uh, the phrase was floated. We floated it around anyway, and um, I can't remember whether it was that that was in the video where we were mess- mucking about and couldn't it wasn't broadcasting. Uh, no, 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 we did, that was that was in this talk. But that was you, in said this talk. you said basically that there were um, several points where missing links are suggested oh, yes, to have of existed. Course. Yeah, and did I did I, t- I, I spoke about how that we found that fossil this um, where they they don't know whether to classify it as ape or humans, yeah. so that could well be a missing link. Right, cool. Yeah. Um, so, um, the other thing that I want to stress, that I think we mentioned before, is that it's not a linear progression. Evolution, mm. it wasn't like there was a hominidae that turned into an australopithecine that turned into a, a sort of more human australopithecine to a more human australopithecine, then yeah. going on to the different homo classifications, and it all just happened in one linear fashion. There were loads of evolutionary dead ends, loads of different australopithecines that um, didn't evolve into anything and died out, and yeah. they were all living, loads living together at the same time, and it was just... Well, it's, a, it's a random process, isn't it? Completely random, and one branch of the tree led to us. Mm. Um, so um, it's, uh, it's, it's better to think of it as a bush rather than a line. <laughs> That's a good <laughs> input, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so the next fossil... Um, with the, uh, that was found was about four million from about four million years ago. So we've, we've already jumped two million years, mm. and that's just the next fossil in the record. So that's it shows so much blank space. Yeah, it shows the blank space. It shows how vague this area of history is, but it, we can still sort of get a kind of picture. Mm. And um, basically, four million years ago, they found a really like a really small creature called Artipithecus ramidus, and um, again, it was more ape than human, but it it definitely stood upright, and it had very human-like bones and teeth, Um, and it's been uh, dated four million years ago, uh, potassium dated, Um, so we definitely know that's right. Uh, They Mm -hmm. can do this potassium argon dating again, like carbon dating, and we definitely know that the date is right. Um, but um, like I say, is there it's, a limit it's... on how far back that can date? Because I know that certain materials degrade during fossilization over time. Yeah, I mean, um, it seems like the potassium dating. I might be wrong about this, but from what I've read, it seems like the potassium argon dating didn't go further back from mm. that point. So um, I think there must be a limit. I know there's a limit on carbon dating. 
and um, there's a list. Also, did you know this? Right, you know when they say you're watching Time Team or something, and yeah. they talk about how they've carbon dated this thing to, um, you know, one thousand years ago. Yeah. When when they talk about one thousand years ago, they actually mean from like the nineteen fifties to one thousand years ago. Oh because yeah, because the um the amount of is it to do with the pollutants? Yeah, there was so much nuclear testing and pollutants in the air that it spoils the dating. So their present day is 1950s. <laughs> so whenever you hear someone say, "Oh, it's this is this age and stuff from a thousand years ago," they mean from 1950. They cannot actually date it from today because we just screwed things up so much. Yeah, humanity. Yeah, we rock. Um, <laughs> but um, anyway, there was another one. Another fossil found from four million years ago. So again, completely different creature, but Australopithecine as well, um, mm. called Australopithecus amanensis, found in Kenya, and um, it sort of had it had human-like limbs. So you see where we're going. Like the first one had sort of human-like jaw and teeth. This this well, one has human-like limbs. But I it's have a, a point I wanted to ask about actually. You met, when you mentioned the teeth. Yeah. I was under the impression that human teeth changed a lot when we developed, um, when we harnessed the use of fire and started cooking our food. I realise that's beyond the uh, exact time period that we're looking at now, I think. Um, but is that true? It's, I've, 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 I have heard that as well. But when they say human teeth, what they, I think they're comparing it to pro early humans like Homo erectus and Homo habilis. I don't think they're comparing it to modern humans. All right. Because, like I say, yeah, I mean, cooking has changed things so much. Um, our diet has changed things so much that um, it's it, that they uh, they only compare it. They only compare it to humans, you know, a few million years old. It's nothing. All right. So just like us, really. Okay. Well, two million years is a uh, is nothing in this kind of thing. Oh no. It's Blink of an eye, isn't it? Blink really? of an eye, exactly. Considering what we were talking about on your channel about Napoleon and World War One and all the documentary evidence, just yeah. shows how vague it gets. This is so just beyond my historical comfort zone. It's actually really quite liberating. <laughs> to be honest, it sort of was mine as well. It was very. It wasn't that long ago that I started getting into this, and I've just been listening to sort of uh, lectures on the internet and reading the odd book and stuff, and just getting into it a bit. But mm. um. It was definitely. It's not. It's not a period of history that I think most people think about immediately. No, it's not the most readily accessible. No, and it's probably not the most exciting, especially for someone like an archaeologist or a historian that you know wants to have all these finds and you know you can study Rome and find these great columns and um, ar great architecture and um, writings and all that kind of stuff. You go it back here, like a, a toe, and you've you've done yeah. pretty well for yourself. <laughs> exactly. You've got a, your your main aim in life is to find a skull. Yeah. And then you've done it. You are awesome. <laughs> So um, I can see why it's not a very uh, sort of uh, well-known period of history, but it is really interesting. Mm, it's fascinating. Yeah, so you've got those two. Pray continue. Sorry. No, no, no worries. Um, but yeah, so there's so like few of these fossils, um, but it's um, it's definitely theorised that between seven and four million years ago, there were a huge amount of different primates living in Africa from the loads of different kinds of apes, loads of different kinds of monkeys, and loads of different kind of proto-humans, if you like, mm. um, living in Africa at that time. Now we get on to Lucy, the one that everyone knows. Well, mm. anyone that's ever watched a documentary about this knows. Oh, Basically, yeah. Lucy's, Some kind of BBC love affair with her. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, I remember when they rebuilt it once in one documentary. They were like, re I'm sure they uh, rebuilt Lucy. Was that the one where they, they actually made her face so that everyone? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. You can, she looks, looks like a stood-up monkey. But, yeah, yeah, that's what that's pretty much what they all look like. Then different, various different okay. sizes. Oh, maybe. I'm sure I saw someone that looked like her when I went out for a night out in Salford. <laughs> I know that girl. <laughs> Stop talking about my mother like that. <laughs> <laughs> They's right. Lucy um, is classified as Australopithecus afarensis. How good am I with these names? Have you got um, them all written down in front of you? No, absolutely okay. not. <laughs> I've got bullet points. Basically, I've got this sheet with bullet points on, but I have been reading up on it. I did all this 
pretty much researched for this video last night, so it's quite fresh in the head. I'm and I didn't want to do the selection on this. It's not bad. I have had a few of them written down, from being honest, but that one I've just remembered. I meant to uh, do a lot of research before watching this myself, just so I'd seem like I knew what I was talking about when I was talking to you, but unfortunately I was much too hungover today to even... I told like you a documentary. Process reading. <laughs> I told you a documentary to watch. And you did. You did. About two and a half hours long, it would have clued you up pretty much on loads of stuff. Instead, I sat in the dark and held my head and felt sorry <laughs> for myself. I'll be doing the same tomorrow, mate. I'm telling you. <laughs> they say about mixing grain and grape. Sorry to bring this random so thing it up. It shouldn't be done. Yeah, I was told that the reason you get the bigger hangover is if you don't, if you either stick to grain-based drinks or stick to grape-based drinks or fruit-based drinks. But if you mix them, that's when that's when the bigger hangover comes. I've no idea if there's any truth in that, but something I've heard. Prehistory question. When did yeah. we first discover alcohol? When did we first discover... You know, I, oh, I saw something on this. It was a documentary about how the good things that alcohol have done through, has done through history. And I think... I mean, I presume it would have been some soured fruits that go well, alcoholic. There's um, videos of animals eating fermented fruits. Yeah, for, that's right, fermented. Um, elephants do it quite mm. frequently. Um, oh, yeah, that happens on the savannah, so it's actually yeah. right. what we're talking about. I mean, there's even theories that magic mushrooms played a part in our evolution, that they were around at the time and they were eating food. I can food. picture just the sort of person that makes that argument. <laughs> Yeah, it's a bit. It's the kind of thing you get told in one of those far. head shops. Yeah. Yeah, but um, nah, man, you're just getting in touch with your spiritual history. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, we're all vibrations, really, <laughs> in the, in the uh, textual uh, context of reality. And reality slows down as you slow down. But we mentioned Aldous Huxley anyway. earlier, and he was pretty into that stuff. I mean, he would took mescaline and then wrote that book, Doors of Perception. And it was a pretty good book, and he was a cool guy. Mm, pretty cool guy. So we don't know when alcohol first got was being used. I have no date for you, but I imagine, yeah, fermented, I... souring fruits on the savannas. I imagine it was consumed before that by the hominid in the trees. I mean... Mm -hmm. Is that when, once Even if not intentionally, I can imagine that they'd at least enjoy it. Yeah, and I suppose as their intelligence grew, because I'm going to talk about how the brains got bigger. Yeah. Um, well, I, I mentioned to look before, for it. Um, about the different theories behind that. They would, yeah, it would become part of their social structure, maybe. Mm. Um, especially if, if you if they enjoyed it. Um, and an animal's natural instinct is to find more of it. Yeah. So I'm sure as they got more and more intelligent, they found better ways to get hold of it, and um, who knows? I thought maybe, it was... they a, maybe they had a fermenting machine back then, seven <laughs> million years ago. Well, I know that the oldest written recipe that we have is one for making beer, which was written in ancient Egypt about... Um... I thought it was in Samaria. Oh, it might have been I think it was Samaria, but you're right, yeah, it was. There was a about recipe four for or beer. 5,000 years old. Yeah, um, probably. I think yeah, about five thousand years old, definitely. I think it was. Makes you proud. Yeah, I mean, um, there's all sorts of things they found there. They they found, you know, we're writing on sorting out taxes and all that kind of thing. Sumerian mm. civilization and uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh. Oh, brilliant! First sort of proper story. Um, yeah, we'll Completely get to Sumerian so creation we... myths, but I think we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. Yeah. We will get to Samaria one day, but we've got a few million years we've to go. We've from so standing up to, to writing. I think yeah, yeah, we've missed that's, important steps. It's a big jump, but um, we will get to that in another video, I'm sure. And I'm sure, as like, a, like I don't know if anyone knows this, but the idea behind these videos is that I was going to start at the very beginning because I'm into ancient history and try and start at the very beginning of human history. And Chris studies modern history. He's written to modern history. And he was going to start... Uh, well, we did start on his channel last week talking about World War One and the Napoleonic Wars, and we're sort of gonna he's gonna work his way back. I'm gonna work my way forward and maybe try and meet in the middle. So we, we will try. get to Samaria one day. And as we get closer and closer to the middle, we'll both know more and more about the topics because uh, I, I know you're into. I mean, I know you're pretty into ancient Greece and Rome as well, eh? Yeah. So we'll be Who able knows? to debate and stuff like that. We might even make a video that's interesting. Yeah, one day, one day. That's the aim. Sort of, I want to see written on my tombstone, just, um, he was too good for this world, and that video was interesting. 
<laughs> that would be perfect. And I also want to get what a, fake a good hand. lifetime goal. Yeah, I want to get a fake hand that sticks out of the soil. I think that would be really funny. Just See, a hand sticking out of the soil. I want a more either a mausoleum or a heroic bronze, uh, bronze statue of me, but is that it's, a bit much? <laughs> you know what? I can see where you're coming from. It's weird, isn't it? Like in history, it was always about making your mark on the world, and you wanted to be remembered. And there is still like that to an extent, but you wanted a big tombstone and you know your statue up and stories told about you. And now it's sort of people, you know, cremation and scattering your ashes into the sea. It's um, it's become much less prevalent. No, I want it's... to be cremated as well. I just fancy having a giant bronze statue of me. Oh, I'm, a tra- I'm a traditionalist. In the Greek style? Oh, absolutely. In the, oh, right. well, in neoclassical. <laughs> <Full on. laughs> so it'd have to be a full-on nude statue. Mm, maybe not nude. Yeah, I'd rather well, be in armor. Said Greek style. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you could put armor on. Um, what uh, what kind of armor would you have? Would you, ha- would you Oh, now that's a tough one. Because we could talk about armors for I'll have ages. To, oh, that. Yeah, let's armor. definitely save that for another video. Yeah, okay. Because we've just got very, very off topic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm try- I've kind of forgotten what we were actually talking about. Um, um, so we were talking about Lucy, eh? Well, yeah, we just got to Lucy. Just got to Lucy. Australopithecus africanus. Yeah. And, um, no, Australopithecus, Austral- see, I'm getting Australopithecus afarensis. That's um, the one. Yes, got to get your, your Latin right. Honestly, Alex. <laughs> it's um, basically... It was found in Ethiopia in the 1970s. Um, it was a creature that lived around three million years ago, was four foot tall, and it was an australopithecine. That is what you need to know about Lucy. It okay. was very important because basically they, they did find quite a lot of the skeleton. And it does look really cool, but it just comes up all the freaking time. Um, mm-hmm. but, so that's Lucy. Um, and the main sort of period of the full australopithecines of creatures that we can definitely define as having clear human characteristics was about two million years ago. So we've jumped in time again from mm. slight human characteristics to clear human characteristics, but still very much ape-like. And um, right. that was two million years ago. Lucy was so three what sort million. So distinction years ago. are we talking here from for distinct human characteristics? What is it that that you, makes you them distinct what? rather than than vague. If you saw it, um, first of all, there were many different kinds, and they all were different. But if you saw it compared to ones we were talking about earlier, you'd probably say, "Well, there's not really much difference." We're talking very slight differences, but much more rounded schools. The main mm. thing is the brain, and they had much more rounded schools and um, slight, bit slightly bigger brains, still small brains, but slightly bigger and um, more human-like eyes, and but it's hard to say. Like I say, there were lots of different ones. I mean, there was one that had a really big snout. There was one yeah. that had a more human mouth and stuff. There's different ones, but just um, slightly further along that evolutionary line that they can be classed in their own group. Mm. Um, so that was about two million years ago. Um, what so else should I talk you just about? Got this, this was like one of the top images I found of, of <laughs> when I searched for it. That's cool. I'm glad you brought that up because I don't even think I know how to do that. Um, well, yeah, I can see what you mean by it being a more obviously human uh, construction. I've seen. I mean, that's very clearly upright and. Um, oh yeah, we're definitely broad shoulders at this and point. generally structured like a human being. I mean, the the face is still has a lot of the monkey-like characteristics, yeah. but. It's to be honest with that picture. And there are some monkey titties, as promised for the. Show. Yes, we have we have tits on the show. Robert Parker I has left the group chat. <laughs> oh, right, is he gone? Hey, he's probably gone to uh, turn off his cam and enjoy the monkey tits that he was wanting. Yeah, <laughs> well, and it's some kind of tits anyway. Imagine what he's doing now. Um, anyway, mm, something primal. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like that. that picture, though, I must say, I've seen other ones, reconstructions, where they've got a lot more hair than that, and mm. it's deceiving in the picture. Remember, four foot tall. Yeah. Um, it looks quite... Well, the hair's something we can't know, isn't it? <laughs> no, exactly, but it was much more... It was diminutive. You yeah. would notice if you stood next to that recreation, there was small, that she was small slender, yeah. and yeah, exactly. Um, the So we've got Lucy... Mm. But um, the most, the, the, I think the the best sort of evidence for Australopithecus afarensis, which is what Lucy was, the same group mm. as Lucy, and um, this is really really cool. 
Um, it dates to about three and a half million years ago, so about half a million years before Lucy. And it was discovered by Mary Leakey, the wife of that um, other Leakey guy that was telling about what it yeah. was. Yeah, anyway, um, that, that dude. Um, and it's really, really cool because it's sort of, you get an actual picture of a, like a snapshot of life during that time. Mm. So you've got um, two, so, right, imagine this, open your mind. You have two hominids, these Australopithecus afarensis, mm. walking through a dry riverbed. Mm. And um, they happen to be walking during the aftermath of a volcanic eruption from like right. this local volcano. So the volcano had deposited a load of soft ash on the ground, on the riverbed, mm. which hardened after they'd walked in it in the sun. Mm. So um, you can, what they can, they've actually excavated these footprints. Oh, wow. Um, so we actually have preserved in the ash, the footprints of these two hominids. And you can Fantastic. tell from the footprints, it's all, it's really cool. First of all, you've got that picture of them walking, but also you can tell from the footprints how they walked and they'd, they wouldn't walk, oh. they wouldn't stride like we did. They would, every movement, they'd be swiveling their hips. It would be very, that kind of jerky fashion, if you can imagine. So oh, it'd be right. sort of gates where every movement, you turn your hips one way, turn your hips the other way, and it sort of completely not, changes not your Not quite gait. waddling, but a very... A very primal and... gait. Yeah. It's um, so it would be very got... uncomfortable to do with that with the hips that we've got now. Yes, exactly. I mean, we definitely stride, but mm. um, you can you can do the walk if you wanted. If you wanted to give the walk a go, I could turn my webcam on and show people the walk, <laughs> but I won't. You can imagine you with all the hips. I won't stop you. So should I should I try it? Yeah, why not? I'm gone. Let me turn this webcam on for a bit. Where is it? Camera on. Right, can you see me? I can see you. Okay, I'm going to take my these off for a second. Ooh. And show us the walk. Hang on, I need a big screen. That's Caveman Alex. Let me put my headset on. Can you picture it better now? <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm just picturing it being you in the aftermath of some ancient volcanic eruption. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, walking through an ash ash layer. So it was, yeah, it was, well, it was sort of, it was my ancestor um, in some way. Um, well, it's hard to say. They do think that Ostrobicus afarensis was a sort of precursor to humans, was on that branch, but can't be sure. Um, so it could be an, uh, one of our early ancestors. Um, but anyway... Um, so they found the, the record of how they how they walked at that stage. Yes, and it's, in, it's really nice because it paints a little snapshot of life there of these two hominids, very ape-like, looking like Lucy, you could mm. say with that gate walking through a riverbed. Um, but um, one thing that's really clear about the Australopithecines is that, and not just um, Australopithecus uh, afarensis, all the different Australopithecines, mm. is that as time went on, their brains were getting bigger and bigger. Mm. And like I say, this could be down to the consumption of meat, or it could be the need to find meat. But as, as time went on, and where some, you know, some died off, some changed, some evolved, and um, as a general the, rule, I'm guessing the a, ones as the brains got bigger, it was those branches that survived the more intense. Of course, ones. I mean, the um, with any hunters and scavengers, really, the most important thing for survival is intelligence. You know, mm. where is the prey? Where is the? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, cool. Where's the prey? Where's the water? Where's ed edible vegetations and how stuff? Do we, how do we get the prey whilst not becoming Dying. prey ourselves? Yes, exactly. So intelligence is always key. And um, definitely the ones with the bigger brains. I mean, it's, I'm going to skip it forward in time again now, but you know Neanderthals? No. Yes. They had bigger brains than us. Really? But that doesn't, 
yeah, yeah, the actual size of the brain is bigger. But that doesn't mean that they were more intelligent than us. It's not always about the size of the brain. Well, it's um, wired differently, I suppose. Horses have bigger brains than we do, don't they? And they're, uh, didn't they? Oh, well, they're, I didn't know that. I assume they would, but they're remarkably stupid animals. Mm. Remarkably panicky animals. They mm. fright at anything. I'm just going to have a track of my e-cig. No problem. I'll just refill my cup of tea. Oh, yeah, go for it. Oh, I already made a pot for the chat. Oh, I, I should have done that. So I, I brought up. Have, a... So I wouldn't have to get up. I'm Still. going to be honest with you now. I'm going to. I, I, I'm going to ruin my uh, British street cred, but I brought up a cup of coffee. I know. Uh, I feel really You'd bad like about it. I don't, I don't know if yeah. I want to carry on talking to you. A cup of Joe. I brought up a cup of Joe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All that cup of Joe. Um, uh -huh. But um, yes, uh, my coffee is gone. And um, yeah, so the, so, but the, so it doesn't necessarily, it's not always the size of the brain, but especially in this period and in general, it's, it's in the general consensus is as the brains get bigger, you become, they're more intelligent creatures, yeah. but there are exceptions. Of course there's exceptions, but it's a, it's a safe enough general rule. Yes, exactly. So um, basically Australopithecus afarensis, this is, this is the current um, belief by the experts. Mm. One that Lucy is a part of and that was slowly gaining more intelligence as time went on. And they were talking two million years ago and yeah. um, split into two branches. And one of these branches became the first true humans, if you like, the first true homos. I've yeah. got to use the word. I'm going to be using the word homo a lot. Um, it doesn't bother me. Yeah, basically. You're adult. <laughs> exactly. We're mature about this. <laughs> homo, all homo means is the creatures, we've gone out of the Australopithecine class of very mixed with apes to a class where they're still quite ape-like, but they are clearly human. They've yeah. clearly moved on. The, the, um, I wanted to get into the main homos um, in the next video, but I just want to talk briefly about one of them because there is one that sort of doesn't fit into both groups. It's sort of in the middle. Okay. Um, uh, but it's classed as homo, but it's it's not it's not considered fully human. But it was the first toolmaker. Oh um, right. And this is Homo habilis, mm. right? And we're talking from, from about two million years ago um, onwards. Um, or no, they said one point nine million years ago, I think onwards. Yeah. Um, to be specific, um, you you've got Homo habilis, and it was the first stone toolmaker. And it was, um, like I say, it was still more ape than human. So it's in this middle ground, but it was, um, it was, it was sort of the first. It was the first time any any of these creatures had actually fashioned their own tools. Like we said at the beginning, the hands were free. So rather than just adopting, picking up stones to use, they're actually fashioning. Fashioning. Yeah, like, very crudely fashioning, splitting basic... stone on a rock. And basic chiseling yeah you're using the edge to cut through an animal carcass we're mm. not talking about flint napping where they're making beautiful spearheads and all that kind oh, of oh no no i didn't think we'd that <laughs> no. overnight <laughs> all that oh god that flint napping apparently it looks amazing when it's finished but apparently it's so hard to do so it took like this guy 50 years to master it on this program i was watching so you've got to imagine when we get to neanderthal man even homo erectus and um he um, and um, the first Homo sapiens, um, they, they were incredibly intelligent at what they had to do at the time. It's incredibly mm. difficult work. But anyway, this is really basic sort mm. of um, make, uh, but, uh, tool making. But the point isn't the, the level of skill demonstrated, it's the fact that it's being done. Exactly, yes. Yeah. The fact that it's being done, it's being, they're actually, they've actually got the intelligence to smash a rock onto another rock in order to get a sharp edge that will cut through an animal carcass it's fantastic it's really cool so basically you've got this period sort of two two million years ago um uh, well two to 1.9 million years ago where you've got still the australopithecines around you've got these three sort of branches um you've got um three branches of sort of hominids that we are aware of hmm. but 
there could have been so many more and there probably were so many more these would these would have been the most dominant by this point i assume that there are, I assume there are minor. There would be a few minor distinctions between branches, but there's these three major ones that would have been dominant. Yeah, I mean, it seems like that because the the fossil record seems to contain, um, you know, that's what we're finding. We I've not found any, yeah. but that's what they're finding. Um, but it, it not you know not necessarily new evidence may come to light. And the other amazing thing, which I really love about this kind of stuff, is that. Um, new evidence comes to light all the time that completely changes everything and if there's one thing i love about science it's that when new evidence comes to light it changes its views mm. that is um people call scientists close-minded the, yeah. the definitive default position is we don't know anything and it's only yeah. when there's evidence that we fill in these gaps and then when new evidence comes to light we change our minds how is that close-minded yeah. I keep saying I have, we, I'm not a scientist either. I have um, a question. Yes. Uh, with this period that we're in at the moment that we're looking at, with these first tool makers, these first primitive tool fashion. Homo habilis, yeah. Homo habilis. Are we still 100% in Africa at this yes, point? Yes, everything is in Africa, uh, mainly East Africa. It hmm. wasn't until, basically, you had Homo habilis. I'm going to jump ahead because I was going to finish hmm. at Homo habilis, but very quickly. You had Homo habilis, and that eventually evolved into Homo erectus, which was the first real toolmaker that did fashion spears and yeah. did th and that kind of thing. And they were the first ones to leave Africa, and they populated most of the world. They crossed, uh, was it, there was still a land bridge into Europe there was, at that there point? There was a land bridge into Europe. The Sahara Desert, which is the main cutoff these days, um, was very different environmentally. It was sustainable. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't rich grassland, it wasn't but it was ideal. sustainable. <laughs> it wasn't a dust bowl. Um, mm. uh, so they could cross that, they could cross into Europe. And this is where you get Neanderthal and Homo sapiens. So you've got to imagine you've got Homo erectus in Europe and in Africa as well. Mm. And in Europe, it evolved into Neanderthal. Yeah. And in Africa, it evolved eventually into Homo sapiens, us. Mm. So we came from Africa. And then and it's one wiped out the other. Well, yeah. that is the dominant theory. There are a few others floating around. But yeah, they definitely, when we came over to Europe, pretty quickly, Neanderthal dies out. Mm. Um, there was, until very recently, um there was it's weird how these things change pretty recently they sort of discovered that we could breed with them that we bred with them and oh, then right. i think very recently that was turned up turned down and it was actually believed that we couldn't but um i mean there's even there's um there's there's some evidence that they lived for a time together so you've got to imagine these two different humans and um, Neanderthal was not the stupid caveman like everyone thinks. Hmm. That was basically, that came from a very old fossil um, of a, a very old Neanderthal skeleton that was riddled with arthritis that this guy, I can't remember his name now, but he was the one who painted the picture of, you know, the, the dumb. The sort of hunchback shuffling. Exactly. Um, but really, I mean... But creatures like that don't don't survive. No, no, and uh, that's why it didn't, you know, that's probably what killed it. Hmm. But they were, they were much more robust than us, much stronger. Hmm. They had their own... It's, it's very strange to think about. I'm not going to say religion, but they clearly buried their dead, and not just for reasons of, you know, predators. Or they practical. buried their dead. They'd have... Uh, the, With you know, ceremony. These, there's, uh, yeah, in the fetal position, there's evidence of males and females buried together. So that means there must have been some kind of belief there or, hmm. or you know, that kind or of thing. I don't really know the right word for it. Yeah, exactly. Um, so they were, they were intelligent, very intelligent, and they, their throats were capable of language. So mm. they probably had language. Um, so And like I say, they had bigger brains than us. Not necessarily smarter. I mean, they do they do believe that obviously Homo sapiens were much cleverer, um, mm. but it was also a lot of it was circumstance as well. And Neanderthals would die very young because they were very robust. But the way that they hunted was that they fashioned you know they fashioned big spears and they would get right up close to their the, the prey they were killing, and it was dangerous animals. You know, imagine mm. 
going up to a bear, you know, head on with like four of them around it. Whereas Homo sapiens developed very light spears that they could throw and bows and arrows and things like that. So they were dug much... traps as well, but we're not going to have any evidence of that. No, but I mean, of course, they, I mean, you look at when you get to Homo sapiens, you've just got to look at cultures these days, like the Maasai and all that kind of thing, mm. um, and hunter gatherer cultures. And they, uh, if you took if you took a Homo sapien from when they first developed, I think it was about two hundred thousand years ago. Mm. Um, and stuck him in a school today, a baby, mm. um, and brought him up in nursery and put him in primary school and all that kind of thing. They will grow up to be just as intelligent as we are. Mm. They they had the exact same capacity. It was just took time to become aware of these things and learn about these things. And you know, as, as the civilizations changed, but they had the exact same brain capacity as we did. So you've got to imagine that hunter gatherers back then were completely as capable as hunter gatherer societies that we see nowadays. Yeah. Closing my window because of lights on. I don't want flies to come in. Um, but yeah, anyway, where were we? Um, <laughs> uh, we were talking about, oh, yeah, we we're talking about these three branches, eh? Yeah. So you've got, yeah, two million years ago, uh, there were three branches of hominids that we're aware of. Um, probably more of them, but um, you had Australopithecus africanus, which was a very small delicate humanoid with it had this long snout though um, really mobile um, and that seems to have just been an evolutionary dead end because there's not much evidence of the things happening to that afterwards yeah. um, or there's no evidence whatsoever um, there was also Australopithecus robustus yeah. and you can probably tell from the name robustus it's quite it's, robust it was robust exactly well done 10 house mm -hmm. points um, Hooray. Was, <laughs> gold stars all around it was robust um i had a really big skull um mm. but it was a plant eater there's no evidence oh, yeah. that it ate meat um so you know vegetarians aren't you know vegetarian stories it's not a new thing as, yeah but they're always imagined as like oh you need meat you know you need meat yeah. to be tough but you really don't hmm. i'm not um anyway you have the third one which is homo habilis which is the one that was in between that was the first tour maker and it was discovered by mary and lewis leakey once again yeah. in Olduvai gorge in tanzania that yep. place that we were just talking about so it's all oh my microphone's being funny <laughs> you're still coming through all right cool no it's 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 on a weird wire that it, you've got to bend it to get it towards your mouth like i'm sure yours is but it uh, keeps sort of slowly moving away from uh, mine's you. actually so completely solid it's just um very sensitive uh well that you see that the one i was trying to use is like that but um it, it wasn't working this one's sort oh. of a bendy wire that you attach into the headset this is the cheap 9.99 one but it oh, seems okay. to be pretty good anyway, anyway. um Homo habilis, it was pretty small um, hominid mm -hmm. um, with thin bones, a uh, much more rounded skull, and sort of much more human characteristics than the Australopithecines. Um, much more upright, much more human face. Um, you would be able to tell the difference, even though it would still be, you know, pretty hairy and still have be able, capable of climbing trees and that kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. It was found scattered around basically the first fossil in Olduvai Gorge. It was it was perfect. The fossil was found and it scattered around the fossil were stone tools and broken animal bones. Wow. So um, you couldn't get a more perfect picture. Um, and it was um, uh, the, the, the um, sort of, uh, the, I'm trying to think, um, this was a vague memory, but the one I mentioned previously, the Robustus one, was mm. first, just just random fact here, was first was thought to be the first tool maker in the 50s, but oh, yeah. because they found broken animal bones around it, but then later research discovered that, that they were from hyenas. So we definitely oh. know now that Homo habilis is the first true, um, sort of like tool maker and the first true human. Um, even though it's still too ape-like to begin to fall into that homo group it's got the, the term homo behind it it's like a venn diagram in the middle bit all ah, right yeah so um, it's still we're overlap territory but exactly but definitely i'd say I, my, me personally i'd say much more in the the homo category than the australopithecine category okay um, 
So it was four foot, three inches tall, weighed 88 pounds. This I am reading, I would never remember this. Um, it was um, small and sort of like slender. Um, and like most of them, like I keep saying, most of them were small, except for Robustus there. Mm. Um, it looked much, it looked like an Australopithecine. It had human features, face wise, and stuff like that, um, slightly, and a much a rounded skull. But if you, they were running past you, an Australopithecine and Homo habilis, you'd be hard pressed to tell the difference. Um, <laughs> it's, um, but the, the, the thing, the reason they say it's more human like is because the head was higher up as well as being right. rounder. So it was much more. Um, like I say, upright with his head. No, it, you know when you see monkey, the heads are always looking at the ground. Yeah. Until they look up, and they've got that slant and that hunchback. Yeah, um, because they're de designed to be to be hunched when they're looking around rather than upright. Obviously. Exactly. This was not like that. This was mm. much more human-like in the the way the head was. The mm. face sort of would be sticking out less. Um, it would have a smaller sort of jaw than the Australopithecines, you know, slightly more human features. Yeah. Um, and it had a larger brain, which is the most important thing. Yeah. It had better hands that were able to grip things. And it was actually the first one that had opposable thumbs. Ah, right. So that is I'd, huge. I'd call that a, a big, big step. Yeah, thing. definitely. It's, um, human. it's, it's, it just, it meant that that's the reason. I mean, Look at it like that. The, the first creature with opposable thumbs was the first creature to make stone tools. So mm. it, that's just the way it's that's the way it works. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it had, you know, it, it it could manipulate things very easily in its hands. Um, it had. It would still though have like longer, you know, like more ape-like arms, oh, like yeah. really long arms, but the hands were human. Um, mm. So it would still be tree dwelling. Um, and there's even, I think, because there was a theory that they slept in camps because at one time animal skins were found near one. But it, the new theory is that they probably went into the trees to sleep in order to get mm. away from predators because that would be the most obvious thing to do. This is where it's just, you know, the common sense theory idea. If you have the capability to climb trees, you would probably sleep in the trees. Yeah, just... You know what I mean. Just, just to be safe, it make it makes sense if you've got a, a a better place to get away from. Exactly. Predators. Yeah. Um. So. Basically. Um. I think we're pretty much coming to the end now because we're, what I wanted we're about to, do, to go real human. Yeah. Well, basically, after this, we get to Homo erectus, and then we we're, we're getting to you know where proper stone tool making yeah. and. Um, proper hunting and making its way around the world. These are humans. They're mm. early humans, but they are humans. And then we, we're going to, you know, we'll talk properly about Neanderthals and the first Homo sapiens and their journey out of Africa and how yeah. they populated the different areas of the world in different periods. So mm. it's talking about you're going at it from a completely different angle. So I think this yeah. is probably the this best. This be a good way. place to call no, it. I reckon so. Uh, how long have we been going for? How'd you tell uh, that? I couldn't tell you, but we'll, well find that'll out. That'll be interesting to find out. Um, I mean, is there anything else that uh, comes to mind that you want to... No, you've been, you've been very succinct. That's been very, very yes. interesting. So I'd it... like to say thank you. No, for it's no problem on. at all. Um, you know, thanks for being here. And um, I'm sure I will see you on your channel next week. Yeah, um, definitely. Or, or whenever we do, because... Yeah, let's with not be too with specific. our limitations. I don't think we can we can promise anything. No, no. I mean, oh god, this was meant to get start at eight, and I think it started quarter past nine. Yes, yeah, but so I was, we were both here at eight. We, that we, we can promise. <laughs> yeah, I called him at five to eight to make sure that um, I was setting it up right, and then it took me an hour to get it set up. And then for 20 minutes, we were chatting and it wasn't live because I hadn't pressed the broadcast button. So a lot of it was my fault, but we were both here at eight yeah. trying. And we had one listener this time. So that is a step up from last time. So. Yeah, I wasn't expecting that. Um, thank you, Robert Parker. I hope to, you uh, come again. Um, if you're not too busy, you know, 
looking at different titties, um, <laughs> <laughs> then you're welcome to join us. Yeah. All right. Cool. So um, cheers for coming on. I Thanks shall you. see you when I see you on your channel and then you can come back onto mine and so right. on and so on. And, we can um, it up. and we'll leave it there. Cool. Thanks anyone who watches this when it's recorded, anyone listening to us, I really appreciate it. And um, I'm sure we'll both be putting up videos soon. Just check out Chris's channel. I will leave a link to it in the description. It's really Thank cool. You. And it was, you know, when I saw his channel, it made me start my channel. So um, big inspiration. And um, check out my channel. I will be putting up another video at some point, even though it's taking me so long. Um, but um, yeah, I shall see you soon. YouTube stuff. Uh, yeah. yeah, thanks a lot. No worries. See you in a bit, mate. See you later, man.